Look over the book of Matthew, please. Matthew in your Bibles and uh, turn over to Matthew chapter 3. If you didn't uh, look at your bulletin yet, you don't need to, but uh, there's a couple in the back I'll mention in a minute, Mark and Marsha Muscovic. Um, if you have a cell phone, if you'd turn it to a silent or vibrate or something, that would be a good thing. Matthew chapter 3 in your Bibles, and we'll look at several verses there, and we're going to look at a verse in Matthew, Mark, another one in John, just kind of skip through. Uh, I don't want to miss Luke, so we better do Mark, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Otherwise, Luke will feel neglected. But uh, Matthew chapter 3, the story we're coming into is where John the Baptist is preaching. And John the Baptist was really getting a lot of attention. He was the nut on the other side of the tracks, and he was definitely the guy drawing the, the, uh, the crowds. People came from all over. The Jordan River was kind of out in the wilderness area. It was a, a trade route, uh, but... It, there were no towns right there. People come over from Jerusalem and all the other cities. And that's where John was preaching and baptizing. And people were very, very enthused about John's preaching. And it was pretty rough preaching. Uh, the, the common people just loved him. But when the religious leaders came, he chewed them out. And the, uh, anyway, most he made a lot of people mad. By the way, um, if, if somebody, if, if there's a preacher and nobody doesn't like him, he needs to get right with God. Uh, there's no preacher in the Bible that was worth anything and didn't end up in jail or beat up or had rocks thrown at him or something. I'm not hoping for any of that. I'm just telling you, uh, you can't walk close to the one they crucified and have them kiss you. That's just life. As a church, understand, as a church, where, you know, uh, all your business associates aren't going to be your best friends. You know, it's funny, you don't very often find, I don't mean this critically, because I love our political leaders, I pray for them, but it's not very often you find uh, upper-level political figures, members of a church. It's a real strong Bible-preaching church because they want to be liked and sometimes things that I preach offend people. I don't know how, but on occasion it happens. Uh, but anyway, John was getting with it and a new preacher in town, excited ministry, and everybody's going out to check him out. And then he had his head chopped off for preaching on immorality. How's that? Uh, saying this guy, you can't be living with this girl because she's his wife. And he gets arrested, chopped his head off. And by the way, He's lived happily ever after. Yeah. All right, remember that. My end is not on this earth. Uh, it's just a doorway. When I leave this earth, it is no more than stepping out that door, and I am into a new world, not this spooky. Can you see Don Foster in a white robe with a halo and a harp sitting on a cloud? That'd be ridiculous. You know, I could see one of those Cupid outfits maybe, but you know, <laughs> uh, just... Uh, no, look, if you're saved, when you leave this earth, there's a, there's, you're going to, we'll talk about it at the end of the message here. There's a judgment. You're going to get through some things, but we're into a real city, a real place, real buildings, real walls, real streets, real people, real food. Thank God for that. And it will be good. Now, young people, you got to help me. Teenagers, yo, um, uh, that's the only warning you get. Or I'm going to have Arturo throw you guys out. And back there about five rows further, all right? Now there's some bus workers back there that are going to about be former bus workers, okay? So all my teenagers need to sit in church and listen. And I, again, I never mind. I've never called a teenager and said, why weren't you in church? You know, I, I don't know if I'd come hear me every Sunday. I'm really more serious than you've ever met a man being serious. I'm really serious. You don't talk in church, okay? Unless you're saying, where's that book? You know, I'll get away with that. But all young people uh, have a little bit of mercy, but not very much. And, uh, and, and adults, don't, don't cringe. It's all right. I've had more people say, wow, that's so great. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I love our young people. I just spent a week at camp with our teenagers in the snow. And, and uh, I don't have a problem with teens. But we're going to have church be church. And uh, we've got to have it. And I realize, see, teenagers don't have any problems. But there's a bunch of adults in here. Ma'am, let's see. Can you help me, Sarah? Why don't you girls go sit somewhere else? You go with her. Just get up and walk forward a pew or two. Yep, yeah, that's you. You go with Sarah because Sarah's a problem. Come on with her. Be a help. Go back by Brother Williams. He's got seats. There you go. I don't mind if both of you go. At least one of you go. That will be a help. And I know this. I couldn't sit by a pretty girl and not talk. There's no way. Uh, unless it was my mother. And uh, 
By the way, parents, if you are a parent of a senior or a junior even, I want to meet Wednesday night about 6.15 and talk about college. If you'd like to meet with me, Wednesday night we'll meet in the Spanish chapel, 6.15, and, and you don't have to get there, but I'm just going to talk about college ideas, answer some questions. We'll do this a couple of times this spring. All right, back to Matthew 3. Let's stand. We'll read a couple of verses together. I don't know what I was talking about, so we'll just start the sermon. All right, Matthew chapter 3. John was getting all the attention, all the praise. Crowds coming to him. John 3, or Matthew 3, verse Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me, that's Jesus he's talking about, is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And uh, we'll just stop there for the sake of time. Lord, bless these moments this morning. Help us as we look at the scriptures. Teach us, please, about who we are and who you are and the mess this nation's become. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Keep your Bible open there. John says to the people, I'm baptizing you. The great crowd's coming here. But look, let me, end, let me explain something. The one who's coming, I don't des- I'm not even good enough to hold his shoe in my hand. I'm nobody. Look on a little bit further. Uh, he talks about the judgment that will come in verse, t- um, verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor. Uh, the Savior's coming with judgment. The Savior's coming with, uh, with wrath. And the first time Jesus came, he came to give his life as an atonement for our sin. But he is coming again, and that's going to be a great day. Um, verse, uh, verse 13, then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. John wouldn't even baptize him. John said, I can't even hold your shoes. How could I baptize you? And of course, Jesus insisted, and Jesus said in verse 15, um, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John baptized him. Now, uh, we're going to look at several verses and just run quickly through the message this morning. And if you'll follow along, um, before we go any further, understand who that we're reading about here, John the Baptist. Jesus said of John, there is not a greater man born of a woman. Than John the Baptist. This is the greatest man ever born to a daddy and mama ever, according to our Lord. And John the Baptist says, uh, the crowds are coming to him. And men, don't we love the the praise of people? Last week, I think I mentioned the reason men marry is because they finally found someone who loved them as much as they loved them. This is lesson two on marriage. The other reason men get married is because they found someone who would praise them and talk good about them as much as they deserve to be praised and talk good about and that's why we get married. In other words, we found a dumb woman. Uh, but anyway, but we all like praise. That's what we are. Um, whether it be basketball tomorrow, got the turn of basketball tournament, we like praise. And, and uh, or, you know, it doesn't matter, mow the lawn. Ladies, go out there and say, honey, no one can mow the lawn like you can mow the lawn. Once every six months, it sure looks good. Uh, but anyway, we're... Uh, we like praise. That's what we are. And uh, John was getting the crowds around him, and he was getting a lot of attention, and a lot of praise. And he said, wait, wait, wait. Let me explain something here. It isn't about me. It's about him. Because the one who's coming, I, don't even, I'm, I couldn't pick up his shoe. I'm not a good enough man. If he left his shoes there and said, bring them to me, I'd have to, get, I'd have to find some way to handle them. I'm not even worthy of touching his shoe. And we're talking about the greatest man that ever lived, the very greatest man born of a woman, Jesus' word. Look over to Mark chapter 1, the same basic parallel passage, Mark chapter 1, Matthew, and then Mark, second book of your New Testament, Mark chapter 1, and look down at verse 7. Mark chapter 1, and again, the introduction of our Lord came through John the Baptist. He was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and he was the forerunner then, one who announced Jesus' coming. Mark chapter 1, verse 7. And Mark was, John was preaching, and it says, And he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose. You know, John said, There's somebody coming. I'm, gonna, I'm telling you about him, but he's coming, and if his shoes were there, I'm not good enough to pick up his shoes. He said, You know what? If he needed someone, to un, a, a servant, if, if this one who's coming needed a servant to come and take his shoes off, I, I'm not even worthy to just untie his shoelace. That's who's coming. And this is the one who said, 
Jesus said he was the greatest man born of a woman. Here, if we look over the book of Luke, you'll find another story. The the sermon this morning is this, I am not worthy. It's a very un-American thought. It's a very uh, un-2013 thought. America and the world were so arrogant. We deserve this and we deserve that. And you know, and you killed my great, 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 great grandpappy and you owe me money. I think, man, I don't even know who you are. Get out of here. We're all, we're all in this, I deserve and I'm worthy. And, and uh, you know, are you prepared to retire like you deserve to retire? Well, I, you know what? I deserve to retire in a lake of fire. I'm nobody. And don't, don't give me any, and I do get credit for what goes on around here. And, and I, I'll tell you one thing, there's people all over this room put in countless hours that do the work, but you know, it's him that's worthy. It's not us. There's a soldier under the days. If you look over to the book of Luke chapter seven, the days we're reading about here during the earthly life of Christ, Israel had been conquered by the Romans. And by the way, this is about a 25 minute introduction and about a five minute sermon. So when you think I'm about done, I'm probably not started. But once I start, it won't be long. But Roman rule was over all of the Israelite people. And there were all kinds of laws. Remember the, in the, uh, the early days of Jesus' ministry, he said, if someone um, asked you to go one mile, go with him two, that's a law. There was a Roman law that I, as a Roman soldier, I'm walking along with my pack, my shield, my whatever, and I see you as a Jewish man in your field working, I could say, carry my bags. And the law was you had to carry it for a mile. That was the law. Can you imagine that these people probably didn't like the Romans a whole lot? And so I'm walking along and Jesus brought this whole new way of thinking. He said, if someone compels you to go a mile, go two. You know, Christian, that's when he talk about going the extra mile. People, people don't understand how many Bible terms there are in our life today, but the extra mile came from that story. And he said, uh, I could force you to go carry my bags and, and all these kind of things. Now, those, there's a lot more about it in the social environment we're looking at. But let's just say this, the Romans were not well liked. Now, there's a centurion in, Mark, in Luke chapter 7. He had a sick servant. Now, the servant was very likely a Jew. He might have been a slave. Slavery was not uncommon in in any day, really, but certainly not in these days. And here this Roman centurion, a century is a hundred. He had a hundred soldiers under him. He wasn't the king, but he was a a big shot. And here he has a servant that's sick. And this Roman soldier had heard about Jesus. And he said to some of the guys that he knew, probably Jewish men, in fact, for sure Jewish men, he said, go ask Jesus if he'll heal my servant. They go, to, they go to Jesus and they say, look, this centurion, he needs help. And he's a good man. He built us a synagogue. He cares about us. And so Jesus is coming. Now, it was hard for, for the soldier even to ask. He understood who he was. He understood these Jews don't like him. But he knew Jesus was what he needed. Look at verse 6 of Luke chapter 7. Luke 7 verse 6. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, word came to the the centurion, we assume, that he was coming. The centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself. And look at this next line. For I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof. Here's a soldier. He could have commanded Jesus to carry his bags. He could have commanded Jesus and his disciples to carry the gear for a, a dozen of his soldiers. Here's a man who had total authority over the Jewish people. He had power to jail them. He had power to to abuse them. And, And yet, when Jesus comes into his presence, even nearing his presence, the words were, you can't, you can't come into my house because I'm not worthy of you being in my house. This morning, I want to just take a few minutes and talk about this one little thought, I am not worthy. I'm unworthy. America has taught us that we deserve a whole lot. One of the the dumbest things you hear in married couples is, I'm not having my needs met. Um, Could I tell you that I don't remember anywhere in the vows that said your needs would be met? Don's boy Adam's going to walk down this aisle. Oh, he's going to walk down that aisle with me. It's beautiful bride Connie's going to come down the aisle and he'll come up she'll come up here he'll go down and grab her and sweep her off her feet and and, uh, I'll stand here and I'll say Adam 
Do you promise to love, honor, cherish, and meet all of her needs the rest of her life? You think I'm going to say that? No. Will you love her, honor, in sickness and in health, in poverty and in poverty? I always say this wealth. It's never happened. In all of our weddings, it's never once happened. I'm throwing that out. That's got nothing to do with our marriages. I'm going to say to Connie, Connie, would you have this man and love him, honor, cherish? Uh, keep only to him so long as you both shall live, for bad or for worse, in sickness and in health. Look, you're stepping into this thing for the good days and the bad days. And then a few years later, someone comes, I just don't feel like she's meeting my needs. Anyway, we're a mess. We're a mess in America. You know, it's funny. Somehow we get the idea in America that people had happier marriages back then when divorce didn't happen so much. No, they had enough character to keep their marriage vows. Now, I'm not picking on you. Half our church has been through divorce. Don't, don't feel bad. My parents have been. That's where we live. And we all, none of us like it. No one enjoyed breaking off a marriage and getting hurt and rejected. We're, so don't, don't take that critically. I'm just telling you, we're in a society where it's all about me and it's all about us and it's all about my things and my freedom. And, you know, I married this girl and she wants me to give up my basketball league and my softball league and my bowling league and the, and the three hot rods and the seven motorcycles and my, my weekends in Vegas. And what is she thinking? I don't know. Guess she kind of thought you were marrying her. But the fact is, we are very much wrapped up in us today. Churches are this way. You know, the, we, we are we're protesters, you know. We're not. We demand our rights. You have a right to face God. That's your right. It's the only rights we've got. It's the only rights you've got. Now, thank God for America. We have incredible privileges here. And because of our founder's wisdom for these 200 years, we've had some rights. But I mean in the scope of eternity, in the scope of the globe, we don't have rights. And you go to any country in the world, our rights are, look, our rights are pretty limited. You talk to our missionaries in China, our missionaries in Southeast Asia, talk to our missionaries in Iraq and Iran and Baghdad, ask about their rights. I'll tell you what the right they've got. They've got a right to die and face Jesus. That's their rights. The statement John made several times, the statement many others made, you'll see, I am not worthy. There's a song years ago, an old song, not many people hear it anymore. I'm not worthy the least of his favor. But Jesus left heaven for me. The word became flesh and he died as my savior forsaken on dark Calvary. I'm not worthy the least of his favor, but in the beloved I stand. Now I'm an heir with my wonderful Savior, and all things are mine at his hand. I'm not worthy the least of his favor, but he is preparing a place where I shall dwell with my glorified Savior forever to look on his face. I'm not worthy, this dull tongue repeats it. I'm not worthy, this glad heart repeats it. Jesus left heaven to die in my place. What mercy, what love, and what grace. I am not worthy. Can you say that to yourself in your heart? I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Let me tell you something. I'm not worthy. You look back 2,000 years, I'm not worthy of that cross. You look at our country and how rich we are, and, and I'm not bemoaning it. I love it. I love the fact that I've got two cars. I love the fact that I've got a house and with air conditioning and heating and running water. I'm not gloating. I just think it's awesome. And I've been in other countries. They're wonderful people, but I like America. Uh, I've been in the Midwest. I like America. I looked this morning when I got up thinking about a daughter in Baltimore. And I have this little weather thing on my phone. And Chicago right now, it's 34. And I skim over to Baltimore. It's 48. And I go to Wildemar. It's 55. Do I need to say more? <laughs> I like California. The ocean's there, the desert's there, the snow's there, and I'm here. That's a good thing. I, I, I don't, I don't uh, dislike, but I want you to know something. I'm not worthy. If I'd have been born in India to a family with 5,000 little deities in a little tiny altar, those people are every bit as good as me. Those people who were born in poverty where they're never going to have a stomach full and they're barely going to live, they're every bit as good a people as me and for, as you. And I hope this morning we can just understand a little bit, not that we're better than any other human being, but how much better he is than us. 
We've come far in America in making man a lot more godlike and God a lot more manlike than we should. Look over to the Gospel of John, chapter 18. If, I, I remember, oh, often this type of thing has been said. You're looking for John, chapter 18, the end of our Lord's earthly ministry, or nearing it, he's about to be arrested and crucified. But I remember many times things like this being said. I had a guy say to me one time, uh, witnessing his out soul winning, and a guy said, if God doesn't like me like I am, then you know what? He can just like it or lump it. And I'm thinking, you are crazy. Yeah. You are nutso. Let me just assure you, God could, if I was God, I'd have turned him into a tur turnip or a cockroach or I don't know. But God's up in heaven looking at this idiot. I was down in San Diego this week, uh, last week, I don't know, in the last few days at Doug Fisher's church. And going east on whatever, 195 or whatever that freeway is, there's a big billboard that says atheism, a personal re relationship with reality. And I thought, man, that's a wasted bunch of money. You know, if I was God and I watched the guy putting that up, I'd have done this. I'd have let him be swinging from one little piece of duct tape. <laughs> Say, you believe you're an atheist now? <laughs> now I'd pull him back up and let him finish the billboard. And when he's done with it and got down, it'd say, Christianity, a wonderful relationship with an incredible God. Yeah. And, and, and he'd have to go up and take it down and do it again. I'd, and I, every time he put it up, I'd change it. It'd be like a rotating banner up there. It's all about Jesus. Do you ever think how much God puts up with? How much God tolerates of our arrogance, our self-exaltation. You know what? I, I don't know if I believe that Bible. Well, God's just broken in heaven over you. You know, the books written on why the Bible's not so. God didn't care. He write 10,000 books why God God didn't write a book or God isn't real. And, you know, Madeline Murray O'Hare, famous atheist of years ago. Do you think God wept any tears over her? What's amazing is Ezekiel says, God has no pleasure that the wicked should die. What a God that loves people who hate him. That is incredible. But in America, we've really come a long way in lifting man up. What I deserve and what I'm worthy of and, and all the things I should have. And, and America's kind of spoiled us because we really do have a lot. You know, I, I deserve a college education. I deserve to work the rest of my life for nothing. Besides, most college educations aren't worth anything anyhow these days. But look at John 18. John chapter 18, look down if you would. Uh, verse 4, the disciples are in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Judas has betrayed him, brought people, the swords, the torches are lit, and they're bringing the crowd to arrest Jesus. And in verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and, saith unto, and said unto them, Who seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon, as he, as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. I love that story. You know, I hope we have drive-in movies in heaven. I hope we have giant HD whatever. I don't know what it'll be. Could you imagine? I go into Costco and look at those TVs, and I think we don't even have a TV in our house because ours doesn't look like that. But could you imagine what God could do? I mean, it might be visual reality replay up there. I have no idea. But there's, I think it'd be great if we all got to heaven and God said, what do you want to see next? No one's going to be saying Roy Rogers. And there's going to be great stories. And I don't know if he'd ever let us do that, but I'll tell you, this is one I'd like. And she, this crowd of thugs, swords, spears, pitchforks, torches, and there's a whole bunch of them coming after one man and his puny few disciples up there in the dark. And Jesus says, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus. And he says, I hear I am. Whew, they all fall down. I love that. I'd like that to have the replay button. Vroom, 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 vroom. Man, just think. Now the point is this. When you come face to face with Jesus Christ, there will be no arrogance left. There will be no cockiness. 
There'll be no, well, I'll tell you, I don't like how you, no one's going to be saying they didn't like how he nothing. We're going to be on our face and just, please don't kill me. <laughs> And I make fun of Fanny Cross because she's an incredible lady. They wrote many of the hymns in your hymn, though, but the one I always think of, Sweet Hour of Prayer, Sweet Hour of Prayer that Calls Me from a World. And by the way, I love that song. But that one line, uh, and shout while passing through the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. I think nobody's going to be shouting, farewell, farewell. We're going to be going, ah! I mean, you talk about scary. If right now the trumpet sounded, you that are saved, you would be having arrhythmia, cardiac arrest. There'd be a whole lot of things happening we won't talk about. But, I mean, panic. Let's just say panic, all right? Absolute, sheer panic. You that aren't saved, you're going to have the exact same thing with a worse ending. Yeah. I mean, now, if you hear a trumpet and, and there's about eight of you left, my Bible's right here. You're welcome to it. What a mess, man. You don't want to, you want to, you want to face Jesus humbly with a broken heart. Look over to Revelation chapter four. This is no earthly man, this man, Jesus. He was not a common son born to a father and to a mother. This is God's son. And I think if there's anything that we need a resurrection of, a rebirth of in our churches, is God is God. And I am unworthy. I mentioned yesterday, my wife and I were speaking for Kirk Beard up in Hemet Parkway Baptist. By the way, he's doing well. Uh, almost 15 years ago, we helped start a church up there. We flew the beards out. We knocked on doors, did the special music. We did a lot of things for him. I didn't, I didn't do anything. You did it. But um, our church is doing so well. And they wrestled through pr problems with buildings forever. But they're now joined in with another church they got the most beautiful facilities they're not theirs yet but the pastor's hinting he just wants to give it all to brother beard and what an incredible thing that'd be but great day yesterday friday night and saturday their first couples meeting like a couples retreat but uh, i just said this i said to the men i said if my wife cussed me to my face and called me every dirty name in the world i've got no reason to say anything but thank you 31 years she's lived with me 31 years she's dealt with my inadequacies and my weaknesses. And I can tell you, she has never criticized me. You know what I'm due? She's 53 also, so, you know, somewhere along in here, there's going to be some hormonal issues. <laughs> Not my wife. She's totally controlled. I mean, absolutely. I'm due. And what, how, how do you deserve what we have in America? How do we deserve what I have in a wife? How do I deserve the children I have? How do I deserve the friends I have? I was on the uh, Friday night driving up to Hammett to preach uh, the opening night, uh, the, the meeting, and, and I was on the phone with Rod Renfro, and he's driving from L.A., and he's in a freeway, crowded, and I'm on no, you know, blind road, no, no people on the road, and, and I was just thinking, I have got the best friends in the whole world. What a privilege to have friends. What a privilege to have men that are real men that love God and love right and, and do their job at work and love their God and love their families. And now I was thinking about our church as I drove to, I love our church. No one deserves this. No one deserves this. And can I tell you, you don't deserve your car. You don't deserve your house. You don't deserve your health. You don't deserve the nice clothes you wear. You don't deserve what we're going to eat for lunch. You know why people pray over their food? Someone says, would you bless the food? No. But I'll sure thank God for it. Yeah. I can't bless it. Uh, I'm hoping there's no, you know, whatever disease in it. But, man, I, I, I don't know. What, my wife's got something. I don't know what it is, but I saw it. Anyway, I'm Mr. Detailed. I think it's food. But there's something at home in a crock pot. And I look at that and I think, I don't deserve that food. I don't deserve, man. We, have, we were at Costco last night. We bought chicken and we bought chicken and we, <laughs> we bought fr what a, you walk through think where you shop this week do you deserve to do we deserve a walmart i know people it's funny i can't tell you who this is but someday i will one of our one of our people better educated maybe a little they weren't used to us let's just say that they said you shop at walmart 
I said, yeah. You really, you shop at Walmart. Guys, don't be a distraction over here, would you? Um, I said, yeah. And you know what? They moved. But by the time they moved, 10, 12 years later, they shopped at Walmart. <laughs> Now, if you don't, I don't mind. It doesn't matter. But I shop at Walmart, and, and uh, I, I look, man. I, I'm not worthy. Of, I'm not worthy of this building. I've I've often thought, put up a tent. We don't deserve all that we have. I, I like it. I love the fact this morning I got up, and uh, in fact, one morning this week it was 60, 61 or 62 in our house. And I looked at the thermometer and thought, I think I should turn the heat on in this place. Man, it's cold and icicles on my eyebrows. But I don't deserve I love it. But I, look, get over this thing thinking we deserve it. Yeah. And if your wife puts up with you, you're blessed. If your husband works and, and uh, cares for you, you're blessed. What a wonderful thing. Revelation. Have you got, I'm waiting for you to find Revelation. <laughs> Revelation 4. You find it? Revelation chapter 4. I want to show you where we're going, and I don't have time to go through all this, but I just want you to, to get a little bit of a glimpse. I love this. I've just about memorized all this, this whole section. I love this. Verse 1, after this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now, over in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it talks about a trumpet, and it's the rapture, we call it. This is likened to it's just like John was going to be shown what's going to happen in the future and from clear back here in the time of Christ John is shot up into the future maybe tomorrow who knows when the rapture is going to come and John hears the trumpet the voice like a trumpet calling him up into the sky and so that's where we are in the story it's what you're going to see you want to know what's going to happen when you get not when you die if you die it'll be a little more relaxed until we all get there together but when the trumpet sounds and the church is caught up together to meet the lord in the air at that instant this is where we're going to be so you're reading right now the first thing you'll see be around and in verse 2, immediately I was in the spirit, and there was a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he it sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardin stone. There was a rainbow about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting. Now, this is heaven, and there's all these important people, and there's beasts flying around the throne. There's a rainbow, there's a giant crystal sea, and you're just, just launched into this thing. And God is himself is on that throne. Now, this is pretty, I think it's exciting, but when I get there, I think it's going to be pretty scary. And look at verse 10, if you would. And the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy. And there's a whole lot to be said here, but let me just stop with the main point. When these people come into the presence of God, you know the first thing they do? Fall on their face. Nobody's going to say, hey, how come you let that happen to me? No one's saying that. No one's saying, how come my friend could eat all the ice cream she wanted and she stayed skinny and I looked at an orange and gained weight? Now, maybe later you're going to wonder about that in heaven. But I mean this opening moment, boom, on your face. There's not going to be any arrogance up there. There's not going to be anybody. How come my brother was a good athlete and I'm bad? How come my sister had a perfect complexion and I had a sandpaper face? Or None of that. None of that. No way. I mean, look, when you get there, you're going to fall on your face. Look over to chapter 5. There's not enough time to go through all this, but I'll bring you into a couple of things. And uh, all the people are gathered together in the most incredible thing. And Jesus shows up here. But if you look at verse 10, And thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign in the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and of beasts, and the elders, and the number of them, was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain and that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I am say blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever and, and notice this in verse 14 now we're up in heaven everybody's praising 
worshiping, giving him all the credit. Verse 14, and the four beasts said, amen. And the four and 20 elders fell down and worshiped. Falling down is going to happen a lot in heaven. Amen. I mean, not like some of you that, that uh, have issues with you. Anyway, won't go there. <laughs> balance is what I'm thinking of, balance issues. There's a whole lot of falling down and worshiping going on. You might wonder why they fall down, because he's God. You might wonder why, why is everybody making such a big deal? He's God, that's why. He's God. He's not a man, he's God. He's not, you know, the, the Hindus have multiple thousands of, of deities and they'll worship whoever. And many of the, the tribal areas of Latin America, you go along paths in the mountains, there'll be a little idol, you're supposed to stop and worship whoever. You know, that's not God. When you face this God, you're on your face. He's God. Look at chapter 7. It gets better. And this, this is a building story. And again, we're not going through it verse by verse, but I love this. This is the most incredible moment in the history of, of eternity when we come before God and we get to see Jesus and we see the, the throne of God in heaven. The new Jerusalem's not coming down. That's not down until chapter 19 back in there. Look at Revelation 7 and verse 9. After this, so John's narrating what he's seeing. Chapter 7, verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, that's America too, praise God, and kindreds, that's Filipinos, and, and uh, Mexico, and Alaska, and Arctic, and Antarctic, and anywhere there's people, uh, and uh, the, all tongues, and uh, kindreds, and people, and tongues stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb, and and all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts. And what did they do? Fall down. There we are. Fall down again. Fall down before the throne on their faces and worship God. Now, we go a lot further in this. And we might in a minute or two. But let me, let me put a little. Uh, this is the sermon here about five minutes. Why? Because I'm not worthy and he is worthy. I'm not worthy to hold his shoe. I'm not worthy to reach over and untie his shoe. I'm not worthy that he should even come into my house, the centurion said. The centurion could have treated Jesus like a slave, but that man knew better. And he said, tell him to don't come. Tell him I'm not worthy. I couldn't have him in my house. And aren't we something? And we walk around. And we think our house is some monument, some wonderful. We're not sure you're worthy to visit me. We're not sure that these people are good enough for us. And we're not sure. That's why the church ought to always be open to people. Now, look, we got it. We got it. We have, I watched one of our security guys walking by a minute ago. And we, we have security. And it's getting more as time goes on. As the world gets more wicked, we'll have more security. But you know what? We want people here. You know, and, and sometimes somebody might, and I've never heard this ever. Thank God I haven't. I've never heard anybody say, um, why do you put up with teenagers who don't listen? Because I was a teenager. I want them to listen. But you know what? They matter. Teenagers matter to me. Children matter to me. Hey, look, don't, don't get thinking there's something sacred about this place. It's just a bunch of plaster. What's sacred is him. It's nothing special. There's a fence around this place. It's not because it's so wonderful. There's a fence around it because people were stealing our bus parts. <laughs> and it's cheaper to put up a fence than to have an armed guard shooting people. Man, we're not, we're not special here. I have a friend, can't even tell you who he is. He might get in trouble. But he has a lot of Marines in his church. And... Um, this is some, this is probably 15 years ago, maybe more, but they were stealing gas from his buses. And they wouldn't just steal it. They'd come up and just poke a hole in the bottom of the tank and stuff a rubber hose in. They'd ruin the tank. And so he told the Marines, and he said, I'm going to, uh, it was always Friday, Saturday night because they fueled the buses. And so he had this guy on the lights and that guy hiding over there, that guy hiding over there. These Marines brought their guns. And the pastor, he's telling me the story. He said, man, I'm on the lights and I see a van pull up down at the bottom hill, downhill. And I see these guys running with their hoses up. 
and I mean it's it's like a, you know a science fair project going on and I flip the lights and yell don't move and they run for the van and start to drive and he said bullets start flying he said my marines are aft and I'm yelling don't shoot and I'm saying oh it'll be all right what are they gonna do call the cops but anyway <laughs> The fence isn't because we're so holy, it's just we can't afford to keep giving God's money to thieves. Man, there's nothing special about me. There's not a guy in the front row who doesn't matter as much to God as me. I'm not worthy. I hope you'll get this in your head. I'm not worthy. John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy. The centurion said, I'm not worthy. And when the people in the book of Revelation saw the Lord, they fell on their face and said, thou art worthy. It's not about me. If I could just take a minute and ask you, how is it that my ears can tell altitude change? Is that just some accident of nature? My ears can sense vibrations that I can't see or touch. My ears can make me sick when I'm on a boat. <laughs> my ears keep me standing up straight. My ears can hear the kind, loving words of my wife and other words if she ever comes up with any of those. You say, what's that got to do with it? He's God, he made those things. I'm not worthy. Man, mankind for generations has been trying to help loss of hearing. And you know what? They start out with this big old tube and, and now they've got these little electronic things. You know what? None of them are right. You ask anybody here that's got hearing aids, it's a total frustration. And God takes that little baby and in the early weeks after conception, that baby, ears. Those ears will plug when you're flying in an airplane or driving up a mountain those ears will keep you balanced those ears will help you feel and hear and sense and God just put them there you say what's so wonderful he's God that's what's so wonderful he's God he's God it all ought to be about him how is it that a bee can make honey you want to just call that a fluke of nature that's a pretty incredible thing this bee can go flower to flower to flower and pick up pollen and while he's doing it, pollinate the, the, the trees and the plants and things. And they all go back. And I don't even know how the bee can find his hive again. And they go over there and they take that stuff. And a bunch of guys who never get out. They're like a wife with four little babies at home. And they never get out. They're just there making honey. And how, how do they know how to do that? How come dinosaurs don't make honey? <laughs> Never, look, he's God. Would you just stop and say, God is incredible. I mean, in your head, in your mind, he's worthy. He's worthy. How is it that, that, um, that water can be solid and liquid and gas? How's that? You take an ice cube, throw it in a pan, turn the fire on. Pretty soon solid becomes liquid. Pretty soon liquid becomes gas and it's gone. How's that? Make that. Hey, great humanity, do one of those for me. And what's even more incredible, I've never seen it, but I've heard it. You put water in a solid tube, put it down at 273 degrees below zero, and they call it the triple point of water, whether it's ice, where it's ice and vapor and liquid at the same time. Figure that out. I, I'm not even going to try. Why bother? That's like saying, why does God love me? Doesn't matter. He just does. It's cool. <laughs> Have you ever watched these new, and I'm not an earth lover, I think these, I do, I think the world's awesome. But I get some of these movies like Planet Earth, and have you ever seen the penguins? Ladies, let me tell you something, penguin moms got it together, they leave the dad with the egg and they go swimming and eating. <laughs> it's like Chick-fil-A at noon. No, all the moms are there. <laughs> Hey, you've never been there. You don't know. I took my grandkids there on Friday, me and my wife and three little grandkids. I looked around. I was the only man in the place. Must have been 50 women and 200 kids. <laughs> but anyway, these, these penguins, if you've, never, if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. If you've never seen it, maybe 10,000 penguins or 1,000 penguins, all in this big circle, all, all the men, and they've all got an egg on their feet. And, you know, and they walk around like this because they got that egg on their feet. And, and it's... 50 below zero, 70 below zero, and those penguins in the outside, and if you see the time-lapse video, all the penguins in the outside are working the way to the inside, all the ones in the inside are working the way to the outside, and it's this constant 
systematic rotation so no penguin is on the outside more than a matter of moments. And you say, how'd that happen? Because if I was out there, I wouldn't be there very long either. <laughs> that just makes sense to me. But if you see the video of it, it is the most miraculous. I mean, it's more orderly than the subways of New York or Chicago or whatever. I mean, it's, he's God. He's God. He's the most incredible, awesome God. We can't do anything. Look, men are just frail and petty and stupid. And here, geese, mate, they pair up for life. We can't, I can't tell one goose from another. How do they know? How do they know? What? Man, geese are incredible. He's God. He's God. That's all we have to do. How is it that sunlight comes down? You look at a clear sunlit day. You know what color you see? None. But all the colors are there. And if you've studied science by watching Pollyanna, <laughs> you know that a prism held up. If you don't know what Pollyanna is, you really watch too many modern. I'm worried people know Spider-Man and not Lone Ranger and Pollyanna. But anyway, that's a girly show. But anyhow, that prism's held up in the and the uh, sun shines through that prism and the refraction of the light. And all of a sudden, light with no color becomes the whole color spectrum. And that's incredible. You want to be able to, to hold up the watch, the, if you have a watch, to hold up your watch and see the light reflect off and see the colors. And just be like, you ever see a little baby when they first discover their hand? <laughs> I mean, that's the greatest toy ever. And then they get a foot. You know, they'll hold their foot up, just look at that foot for a while. With Caleb's twins, you know, it's the other kid's hand. Hold it. Three, I'm a freak. <laughs> uh, twins got to be a whole new world to deal with. But man, what, you know, the way a kid looks at their hand when they first discover it, you ought to look at refracted light and the colors on something next to you and say, he's God. He's God. What a God I serve. He's so worthy, and I'm a nothing. You know what? You couldn't make an egg. You couldn't make a light bulb. And you know what the great exciting thing was? I remember in the, in the ninth grade, we made a, a crystal radio set. Ooh, that was big stuff. God made the crystal. God made the airwaves. Unbelievable. Take that clear sunlight coming down with no color. It hits the grass, makes the grass green. The brown cow eats the green grass, spews out white milk. That's, do you ever just, are you so callous to the world that you can't just look around and say, wow. And if you really want to step up, you go to Dijon's Dairy and get their chocolate milk because there's no chocolate milk like the Don's, Dijon's Dairy chocolate milk. If you don't live right nearby, you don't know, straight over this way, there's a dairy and it's no hormone, no, I don't know, for all I know, it's filled with pesticides, but there is nothing like it on the planet. No grocery store's got chocolate milk like the Don, Dijon's Dairy. But to just sit back and look at the miracle of what God's put around us, how could it be? He's God. Now, could I bring you to the other side? Why did Stephen have to die after his first sermon? He's still God. Do I understand refracted light? Absolutely not. Do I understand bees and honey and, and how an ant knows where to go? And, and uh, man, I, I got no clue. I, and I'll tell you what, I've got no clue why Stephen had to die after that first sermon. I don't know why. I mean, you can see Paul. All right, Paul spent half of his ministry in jail, but he wrote most of the New Testament. What about Stephen? What did he get out of it? I'll tell you what he got. For the last 2,000 years, Stephen's been looking back saying, Whoo, that was great, man. Yeah. Didn't hurt a bit. <laughs> I mean, those stones hit him, and those stones hit him, and he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And he looked up, and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father to receive him to his new home. And from that day till this, passing through the ages, the last 2,000 years, Stephen's looked back thinking, you poor idiots. <laughs> you didn't have a clue. You were doing the best thing that could have ever been done to me. Now, I'm on earth, and I'm thinking, he could have preached for years. He could have done so much. But you see, our perspective is so wrong. 
You ever think about Lazarus? Here Lazarus is. He's on earth, good friend of Jesus, and he dies. He's in the tomb for several days, and the sisters are bawling, being women. You know how girls are. They're kind of emotional, and they're crying. And so Jesus comes along. Now stop the picture. Where's Lazarus? He's with the Lord. Everything's okay. And all of a sudden, if he knows what's going on, I mean, I understand paradise and all that. We're going to be very generic for the sake of the non-theologians here. He's looking, saying, don't you say it, Martha. No, Mary, shut up. <laughs> Do you ever think about that? Don't you, read, don't you think when you read your Bible, do those words just kind of go in and go out? Put yourself in the story. And I could see Lazarus grabbing somebody. Tell her to stop. <laughs> Tell her to stop. Stop what? They're asking the Lord to save me. I am saved, stupid. You've always been a stupid sister. I don't know why God gave me sisters. <laughs> Boom. Now he's in a cold, dark tomb wrapped up in burial claws. Oh, I hate my sisters. <laughs> playing the penguin <laughs> why I'm sure Lazarus now I don't know that Lazarus knew the whole story but uh, God I think if God had not blinded Lazarus he'd have killed his sisters and maybe himself who knows but you know we all think oh it's such a miracle he came back to life and Lazarus saying yeah nice miracle Oh, could I tell you, he's God. We've got to rest in that. He's God. He's God. I don't know why a lot of things happen, but I know he's God. And, and because he's God, and, and because I'm not worthy, in my opinion, there are times just recently I had a situation, a very difficult situation, an impossible situation. And I started praying, and I mean within days, a miracle happened, and God answered that prayer. It's so incredible. And I could take you to my prayer list and show you things I've been praying for for years. And it's like God didn't even care. You ever wonder? I mean, if I, was I holding my fingers right for this prayer? You know, and over here, God's, I didn't brush my teeth before that prayer. You say, how do you, how do you reconcile it? I don't know, but I know this, he loves me. He's answered too many prayers. He's been too good. He sent his son to die for me. Oh, I know there's some times I've seen miracles. I've been in the hospital rooms where we have prayed and had the doctors walk in and say, somebody misread the x-rays. And we're all just saying, yeah, you bet, pal. You betcha. I've, I remember one time we met with the doctor. The doctor was there, ready to roll the person into surgery. And the family was there and I was there and we just prayed. And I always pray for the doctor. And the nurses, man, we want good doctors and nurses. And uh, we prayed, and they went in. And we were standing, we, were, we had not even gotten out to, a, like, really to a waiting room. And the doctor came out, and they were done. They said, something isn't right, and we decided to not do the surgery. I thought, yeah! <laughs> and then these other things, it's been years, and God didn't even hear. Can I tell you this? He's God. He's God. You could trust him. He's God. Let's pray. Father, bless us as we go today. Thank you that we serve God. The God of ears and eyes and bees and planets. The God of light. A God who proved his love on Calvary, giving us his son. Thank you for being our God. And there's no way we understand it all, but we do know you're God. Help us to trust you. And if someone here this morning is not saved, help them to get saved today. Help them to realize you died for them. For those who are saved and wrestling with some difficult times, help them, please. Remind them that there is a God who cares. Bless, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.